Okay, well, I'm just, I'll just, I don't know, should I start over? <laughs> All right, you're good to go. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, just starting over here. Uh, so, yeah, I'm going to be talking about hunting for what I call sneaky pulsars. Um, basically, these are pulsars in uh, places we don't really expect, our pulsars we don't really see anything and we expect them to maybe exist. And so that's why I call them sneaky. Um, so to start off with, I have to talk about the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope, which is the actual sort of telescope that's getting the first data that we're actually kind of following up on. So Fermi has been in space since uh, 2008, collecting light since I think 2009. Um, it has, it's a gamma ray detector, so it fundamentally has two sorts of different detectors. One that you would consider like a more traditional telescope. It's basically like a directional bucket that can count photons. And then also a gamma ray burst monitor, which just looks for bursts pretty much anywhere in the sky of gamma rays. So we're more interested in sort of the photon bucket at the front, it's the big white thing. Uh, and that is the large area telescope. Uh, it is a calorimeter that can detect, roughly speaking, the direction where a uh, gamma ray photon came from, and then also give you a time of arrival and the energy associated with that um, depositing into the calorimeter. So <clears throat> in terms of what you actually get out of this, uh, you can put all these sort of photons in the bucket together with probabilistic models about where the emission is coming from, sort of the diffusion emission from the galaxies, like all these other sources. And you can sort of build up this catalog, which is called the, the um, FGL catalog over time, that tells you roughly where you expect the sources of these emissions to be. Um, and so we only kind of get uh, relative localizations of you know, some number of arc minutes, basically. Uh, you know, on the best case, you're getting down to arc seconds, like one three hundred three thousand six hundred of a degree on the sky. But to give you some like size scale here, because those are kind of like units that are fairly, uh, you know, specific. Um, this histogram here shows the semi-major axis of the localization for most point sources in the FGL catalog, the most recent FGL catalog. So for most of these sources, we're given an ellipse. That's basically saying there's a 95% chance the thing emitting the gamma rays is inside of this ellipse. And here on the histogram, I've got the semi-major axis, or actually the major axis of all of those ellipses, uh, compared to the size of the moon, just to kind of make it so we don't have to talk about like really small, weird units. So in terms of finding things on the sky, uh, this is actually problematic because a lot of these ellipses are like comparable to some extent to the size of the moon. And as you can imagine, there are a lot of stars. If you're looking at say like a normal telescope, there's a lot of stuff inside of something that large. And so when you're looking for, you know, what this thing is at a different wavelength, at a different frequency, that becomes fairly problematic because there's hundreds of thousands, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of things in say the optical with a normal telescope you can see that could be associated. And so that makes it difficult to look at say the optical or the IR or the infrared or the um, uh, ultraviolet because those are all kind of saturated with sources and you have a hard time picking out like, oh yeah, it's that source there, which is important if you want to do say, um, or if you want to uh, actually get some, um, well, I'm just gonna, yeah. oops, yeah, that's important if you wanna try and make some observations about what the stuff actually is. Uh, you need to sort of look at it from another frequency to actually get some idea of what's going on because Generally speaking, with the photons you're counting from the gamma rays, you don't typically have enough information to really make a definitive statement about what this thing is without help from somebody else. Uh, so then that brings up the question of, okay, well, what are these things actually? Um, and to answer that question, I have a graph and some pictures, um, but basically Fermi and the 4FGL catalog and the, the FGL catalog in general splits these things up into kind of three major categories. There are the associated sources, uh, which make up the bulk of the catalog. Those are sources where there is a source, like a bright source inside of the ellipse. And that bright source, uh, you can use some uh, like likelihood arguments to basically say, this is probably the thing that's emitting gamma rays. You can't say that 100% confidently, but you can make a pretty definitive statement. Uh, and that's why they're associated. Um, the smaller fraction there in blue is the identified sources. Those are ones for which you have like definitive confirmation that it's the same object. Um, and that usually comes in the form of uh, correlated variabilities. So if you have say a pulsar, which I'll talk about in a second, those things sort of oscillate on a given time scale. And if they oscillate say at the radio frequencies and at the gamma ray frequencies on the same time scales, you can pretty definitively say like, yeah, that's the thing that's emitting the gamma rays. Um, so those make up a smaller fraction. And then kind of in the middle, we have these, what we call unassociated sources. 
these are sources that have no strong candidates for association. There might be sources in there at other frequencies, but none of them has stood out strongly enough that we really know that we can say anything definitive. And what you'll notice is that over time, this fraction has pretty much always been something like um, uh, one third to one quarter, uh, which is a pretty large fraction. We're talking about you know, roughly one third of the sky in the gamma rays that we effectively have no idea what they are, um, which is not great if you're trying to do like large scale, you know, science with these things. There's just a lot of things that are putting out the highest type of, you know, the highest energy type of light in the universe that we just can't really, uh, don't really know anything about basically. And so the objective of a lot of our projects has been to figure out what these unassociated sources are. Um, so I have to go into a brief aside here about pulsars just to because um, there's people here who probably don't know what those are necessarily, but to kind of give them like the super cursory high level talk here, um, when a massive star eight to 20 times the mass of our sun dies, uh, the intense pressure that happens in the supernova is enough to crush the core down to nuclear densities to the point where this thing is about a solar mass, but only 12 kilometers across. So like the size of Albuquerque, but the whole sun packed down into it. Um, that gives you all sorts of crazy weird effects. They're super interesting from a physics standpoint. Uh, one of the most interesting things is that they have these super strong magnetic fields sort of preserved from the, the progenitor star. Um, and those relic magnetic fields are typically sort of what drives the emission mechanisms that we're seeing. So in particular, the intense like sort of uh, events that happen in the polar regions are typically generating these jets of pulsed emission, which sort of sweep past the earth as the thing rotates very quickly. And that's sort of why they're called pulsars because they pulse if you watch or if you stare at them. Um, we also, the gamma rays sort of come from elsewhere in the field. It's uh, a little bit complicated and like pulsars are still very complicated in general. Emission mechanisms are very complicated in general. Um, but this is sort of like, we get, get all sorts of emission from all sorts of places on the pulsar. And uh, they're one thing in the universe that can produce gamma rays um, among other things. So, in terms of actually making things happen here though, um, like I said, one of the best things we can do here is sort of approach it from the radio. And the reason for that is it's the um, fields are somewhat less crowded in the radio. It's sort of comparable in terms of sky densities to some extent, um, you know, whereas there might be tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of sources in a little uh, positional uncertainty ellipse uh, in the optical, let's say, uh, in the radio, you're dealing with maybe a dozen at worst. Um, which makes it a little bit easier if you're saying wanting to like target every single one of those or do follow up on every single one of those or do some kind of analysis. Um, that's sort of the simple explanation for why we do things at the radio. Um, but we're also just pretty good at finding and like an analyzing uh, a lot of the targets that do produce um, gamma rays. In particular, pulsars are sort of canonically a uh, radio feature, a like uh, a mainstay of the like radio regime. Um, so a lot of our work here uses the VLA, which you can kind of see in my uh, on the comic picture here. Um, and in particular, the VLA uh, has had some substantial efforts over the last 10 years or so, uh, working on identifying, or I should say, working on characterizing these unassociated sources. So uh, these are the 10 years worth of pointings that I talked about. Um, so these are several various projects that have gone into sort of hunting down these unassociated sources. Uh, this plot here is in galactic projections. So you can actually see kind of like the galactic plane there, the slight density. Um, you can also see the whole kind of that the earth is basically just blocking part of the, the, the sky. Um, but these were um, all projects done to follow up on unassociated sources. So over time, uh, as each new FGL release came out with you know, more and more of these unassociated sources, um, Frank Schenzel and Greg Taylor and other collaborators would point the VLA at uh, at as many of them as they could reasonably and try and see what they could find, um, looking for you know, sources that were fairly bright that they could then follow up on with other things to start looking for, typically AGN, so these active galactic nuclei. Um, and the, you could follow up on those and again, you just could be associated and that led to a pretty substantial number of associations over time. Um, so we also have recently put out a paper, uh, Brzezinski et al. 2020, um, that was uh, sort of about the most recent update to this using some new methods and uh, some mosaicing to cover the larger sources and some other fun stuff. Uh, definitely worth, I think it's worth checking out. Um, it also added a really cool bonus, which was the recent uh, VLA sky survey. We basically just got three pointings everywhere on the sky, uh, thanks to the fact that the VLAS surveyed everywhere. 
So that brings up the point of these really interesting fields, sort of the, we're approaching what, what my work actually is with the uh, CARSI. Um, so some number of those fields, uh, you, you know, we scan them with the VLA and then some number of them just have nothing inside of them. Um, and I say nothing here, it's a little bit generous. Uh, technically, we just mean like no significant sources. There might be some sources, but they're, you know, super dim. So we don't really think of them as like significant here. Um, I hope you guys can't hear my cat. Uh, but um, so these are fields that are just emitting gamma rays, but we have no idea. Like we don't see anything in the field that reasonably you could assume is emitting gamma rays. And that makes them pretty weird because you would expect something that's emitting gamma rays to be detectable at other frequencies to some extent. Um, and these empty fields are empty. So they're worth following up on. Uh, one of the more common ideas that we have for what these things might be um, is that they could be pulsars. So they could be these um, pulsars sort of scattered out in the galaxy. And then if they sort of have to punch through enough interstellar medium, well, the gamma rays don't really mind that. But the radio waves can kind of, you know, the that can actually take the pulses and sort of smear them out to the point where their pulsed emission kind of goes away. And since they're typically found using pulsed emission, uh, that makes them difficult to find in sort of pulsation searches. So we, what we can do sort of in lieu of that is we can search for them at lower frequencies. So the overall, what we call continuum, basically the just overall flux, the non-pulse flux, uh, that tends to have a uh, fairly steep spectrum, which means that if you go to lower frequencies, longer wavelengths, you can actually find these things a little bit easier. And so that's why a lot of our projects are done at uh, 1.4 gigahertz or 21 centimeters, um, because that's where we expect to be able to actually sort of hunt these things down and see them. So our combined efforts over the last, um, well, a couple of years, have sort of been three major projects, one of which was the pilot project for all this work. Um, something like 260 hours, if I did my math right, and something like 120 pointings. Um, again, if I did my math right. Uh, and these are all pointings at these empty fields. Um, the, initial, uh, the initial pilot had some super interesting results. So I'm gonna kind of give a canonical or our, our canonical example here. Um, so this is the cannonball pulsar, technically a cannonball pulsar, but I think of it as the cannonball pulsar because it's so awesome. Um, but this is a really cool case where there's a pulsar there, uh, sort of, you can see the little green circle there, uh, the little cutout. At the tip of that little tail there is a pulsar, uh, and it's sort of a very obvious morphological system here. The big sort of circle that you can see on the side there is this, basically the dust of the supernova remnant that the the diffuse like refuse sort of blowing out into the interstellar medium, sort of the, the remnant of the actual explosion. And then what you can see there with this little pulsar at the end of this tail is literally the pulsar got kicked out at like kilometer, several like thousand kilometers per second uh, and just shot past the rest of the debris from the supernova. And it's just sort of flying through interstellar space right now. Um, and so what you're seeing here is like a very interesting thing. It gives you lots of chances to do interesting follow-up and lots of chances to like learn new things about pulsars, pulsar wind nebulas, you know, uh, supernova kicks, et cetera, et cetera. So you can get all sorts of cool science out of this at radio frequencies and then, you know, follow up on it. Uh, you can kind of see this bottom picture here from uh, Pratik's paper coming up in prep uh, where they actually look at it in the x-rays. Um, and there's just all sorts of neat science that you can do. And again, this was something that was found in our pilot observations in one of these empty fields. And there were quite a few interesting other sources. This one's just kind of like the prettiest, um, but the pilot had a success rate of something like 50%. So roughly 50% of the fields that we looked at had something interesting for us to find. Um, and hopefully that continues to be the case. So I'm gonna give a, uh, to talk about what I do on CARSI, I have to go through like the absolutely briefest of your basics of radio astronomy. Um, so I want everyone to think about the VLA uh, in particular. So for any two antennas in the VLA, you're, you fundamentally have like, uh, you're fundamentally have like detectors that you can read off a of voltage from. The, you know, the, the, the light or whatever comes in, and hits, the detect, hits the antennas, that creates some voltage signal. You can kind of connect two of them to a special box and it'll correlate if you input the right delays based on where you expect the stuff to be on the sky, you can correlate that and get out a signal that we call, let's just say a visibility for now. Um, so then let's take a really simple example. Um, let's take a mini VLA here, just so I can plot this and have some fun with it. Um, so we have nine antennas here. So nine antennas, you can link each of them up. You get, I think it's N squared minus N divided by two connections, right? 
because um, each antenna talks to every other antenna. And so what we do is we think about each of those connections is what we consider a baseline. And each baseline gives you some uh, visibility data. And so we kind of plot the visibilities in terms of the UV plane where U and V are basically just the difference in position. So what you're seeing here is for each of these points, we get some visibility amplitude. Um, and we're sort of plotting this in like the difference space here. And this is typically expressed in kilo, kilo, kilo lambda, so basically kilo wavelengths, so thousands of wavelengths, um, which lets us do some other stuff because again, for each of these points, we get some visibility amplitude, which is gonna be important. So each of these has like a, a strength associated with it from these visibilities of associating the antennas. But then also, like I said, it's expressed in kilo wavelengths and we actually aren't looking at just one frequency. We're spread out over some bandwidth and so here I've got four, I've split it up into four frequency channels. And so you can express those each as sort of different kilo, you know, UV and uh, kilo wavelengths. And so that gives you more sort of information in this UV plane. Uh, and then if you let the earth sit and rotate, you actually get something, you know, a more complicated pattern as this thing rotates. And so you fill out more of this UV plane. And that seems kind of, um, I don't know, obtuse at first. But the important thing is actually that this UV plane and the amplitude data on it you can take a Fourier transform of it using CASA and get out a picture of the sky. Um, in this case, I just grabbed a pretty picture of the Crab Nebula from NRAO. Um, but the basic gist of it is that CASA fundamentally is sort of a, a I call it a light gray box uh, around a bunch of Fourier transform math magic. Um, it's a bit more complicated than that. Like there's a lot under the hood that it does. Um, it, it, you know, it does gridding, it does all sorts of like, uh, you know, it can do the flagging to kind of remove bad data. Um, it does a lot of the legwork in terms of calibrating and making sure the fluxes are all relative to something. Um, but fundamentally kind of CASA is like a magical math machine. Um, it's one way to sort of think about it. And this equation here is basically like the simplest version of the Fourier transform. It's actually the reverse of how this should be, but I, it was complicated to type out, so too bad. Um, but that is sort of the basics of how CASA works, like at like a super simple level, like you've got some UV data, you feed that into CASA, you change a few settings, you know, you tweak the black box a little bit. It's a light gray box and a black box. Um, and then out comes a picture. Uh, and what you do is there's sort of along the way, you can tweak those settings in different ways, you know, flip certain switches. And uh, depending on which switches you flip, things take longer and you hopefully get a better picture. Um, so, so let's actually make a picture. Um, so basically the processing here that we're doing on CARC, um, is that we grab a VLA pipeline calibrated data set. Um, so those we are available from the NRAO data archive. Uh, they go through some pipeline processing, which basically just does like the calibration and stuff uh, sort of for you, which makes things a little bit easier. Um, then we do some really basic data flagging, uh, literally just um, chopping off sort of the front and end of the ops, like the, each scan, because those are kind of noisier and some other simple things like that. Um, and then we basically just run tclean, which is sort of the Fourier transform bit with kind of the, the basic simple parameters, just a couple of customized parameters. Um, and this is the first thing that we do in CARC. We typically do this on Xena because it is fairly RAM intensive. Um, for this step in particular, we can use the single GPU partition just because uh, it doesn't require tons and tons of RAM, but doing it on Xena lets us kind of be ready to use Slurm and sort of uh, set it up for runs on big mem nodes when we need something with more memory. Um, so this process takes about an hour to make this image that you're seeing here. Um, and that'll be fairly typical depending on the setup. Um, and what you get out of this is a pretty picture in the Beardus color map um, with the uh, Fermi feed, the Fermi ellipse sort of overlaid on here. And so you can see uh, there's a couple of sources and things like that inside of this picture here that you can see or inside of the ellipse, which is what we're concerned about. And so um, that's sort of promising at first, uh, but there are some problems. Uh, and so back into our intro for radio astronomy here again. Um, the reality is that when you're working with something like the VLA or any interferometer, all of this sort of assumes that this is operating, the antennas are on a flat plane. Um, the reality is it's sort of a, a more 3D effect. And typically that effect is fairly small, but when you're dealing with we, what we call wide field data, which is basically data that like spans a large fraction or a large like area on the sky, the W term starts to become something that you can't just really ignore. And so the Fourier transform gets a little bit more um, ugly or pretty depending on your definitions um, and you start to have to actually like worry about that and sort of run algorithms to try and work that out a little bit and so there's this fairly um, well thought out algorithm called w projection where you can basically reproject your data to sort of minimize the w term 
And there are several papers about this. It's, it's a lot to read. I'm not going to dig too deep into it, but um, this is sort of one thing that you can do to improve your data. And especially if you're worried about sort of uh, sensitivities near the edge of the beam. And, you know, uh, if you're worried about like, um, like various frequencies and stuff like that at the edge of the beam, if you want to find spectral indices for stuff in the field, you kind of need to worry about this. Uh, the other thing that we do often is uh, sort of correcting A terms as well. So uh, kind of putting it at its simplest, um, the antenna has some sort of, or all of the antennas sort of impart like a, a pattern, a special pattern onto the stuff that they look at. Again, it sort of gets convolved with the, the data that we have. And so what you want to do ideally is sort of pull that pattern out because this is like a sensitivity pattern, right? So like this pattern roughly is sort of getting imprinted on your data, which you don't want. And so it's also time dependent, it's frequency dependence, et cetera, et cetera, that makes it complicated. And so there's an algorithm for that as well, which we call a projection. Um, and again, that adds a little bit of time, a little bit of complexity, but you can sort of flip that switch in, uh, in uh, CASA as well. And so putting that all together along with some other small things, uh, we set the gridder to AW project, which runs both of those algorithms, A projection and W projection. We tune a few other parameters and then we give it the first image that we made as like a rough, which tells it roughly like, this is where we expect the flux to be. Um, and that could actually help it in certain cases. And then we also, at least for this, we're ignoring uh, the parts of the sky that are too far away from the pointing center. That's why it's like a circle here. Um, we've kind of hidden away the parts that are like realistically kind of too far away and we don't really trust their sensitivity. And so this circle is basically the stuff that we trust. Um, it's the same kind of picture exactly as the last plot I showed you. Um, it's just that we've kind of cut out the sides and also this is made with a averaged up data set because we only fixed the bug in the full data set uh, like fairly recently. So I didn't have time to get the full, the full data set yet. Um, it's actually running on Xena right now, I think, or it finished fairly recently, I think, but it's, I haven't had time to look at it. So, um, so that's why it's like kind of a little bit noisy and not as pretty as the first one. Um, so these, we send them off to the queue. Uh, these are typically put on the big mem nodes because this extra, you know, gridding and AW projection stuff adds just a ton of complexity and time to the actual uh, reduction. And so uh, these take, um, you know, you can also, uh, use MPI CASA if you want to get a little bit more intense and help things along a little bit faster. Um, MPI CASA is basically just a way of spreading this out across multiple nodes if you have that available. And depending on the exact setup that you use, it can take, you know, somewhere from like 20 hours to like a day and a half. Uh, again, just sort of depending on, are you using MPI CASA? How much RAM can you access? You know, uh, it, are you on the one terabyte node or the three terabyte node? Like what's your realistic like RAM usage? Um, but Typically, this is the kind of thing that goes from, you know, it goes from an hour, like I said, to a day. And so having access to nodes with tons and tons of memory, like the big mem nodes, is obviously super helpful in that case. Um, so there's also polarization. Uh, this is important for us, but I'm not going to dig super deep into how it works because then I would have to put a bunch of equations up on the screen. But basically, um, certain types of sources in the night sky will tend to send off light that tends to wiggle in a particular direction more than in other directions when it's traveling towards you. Um, and so uh, what we're dealing with is pulsars in particular are known to give off a bit of this sort of polarized light, whereas most sources give off what we would consider unpolarized light. Basically there's no preferential wiggle direction, let's say. Um, and so we can actually, using some of the stuff that we have from VLA, we can map out where this polarization is very roughly. And so this image looks pretty much the same as the last one, I'm sure. Um, but actually, if we ignore the one weird, ugly, bright source, which we're just going to just slip under the rug for the moment, uh, this GIF should flash back and forth between them. So this is flashing between the, the, uh, like the total intensity map, which just tells you about all the flux, and the map of Stokes V, which basically tells you about like, where the polarized flux is coming from to some extent. Um, it's a bit more complicated than that, but let's just glaze over that for now. But basically, what you can see is all of the sources that aren't that big, bright, ugly guy sort of just pop out of existence. And that is to be expected. Um, we expect most sources to be unpolarized, which means that they should be basically gone in the polarization map. And so what we would look for, what we're kind of hoping for is not only do we want to find like decently bright sources, um, not only do we want to kind of measure the change over the frequency to see like roughly if it matches what we'd expect for pulsars, but we expect pulsars as well to show up in this map a little bit. And so we can kind of measure that relative to the total flux and get an idea of like how polarized this light is 
Uh, and that can tell us like, oh, it's somewhat more polarized than your average source. Well, that's, that might make it more like, likely to be a pulsar. And if we can find something that's likely to be a pulsar, like, you know, walks like a pulsar, talks like a pulsar, if it's all that stuff and it's inside of this ellipse, that probably becomes something really interesting that we dig into. We, you know, point bigger telescopes at it for pulsation searches. We see what we can find. Um, and that's sort of the goal here is just to see if we can find these sorts of sources um, and to dig down deep into these fields. So now that the pipeline is mostly bug free, thanks to uh, uh, downgrading the CASA 5.6 because of a bug in CASA 6, uh, unfortunately, um, we can actually start to work our way through the rest of the data, not just this sort of one or two test sets I've been working with. And so we have quite a few data sets to work through, um, but thankfully the uh, initial processing doesn't take super long and we don't need to do this massive W projection stuff for every single field, um, just for the fields that have a particular need for it that are particularly uh, noisy and uh, need a little bit of extra help. So we can actually, now that we've got the code all set up, we can hopefully work through these pretty quickly and actually start to find hopefully some interesting pulsars and interesting sources and maybe another cannonball, maybe some other really interesting stuff. Um, so that is what I have for you today. Thanks very much. That was a good talk. Um, I have some questions, but I'm sure other people have questions too. <laughs> All right, I will go first then. Um, yeah, I've got two, I'm sure, extremely naive astronomy questions. Uh, but the HPC question I have is that, is CASA GPU aware? Um, because Fourier, fast Fourier frame transforms are a really common thing to do on GPUs and presumably would give a, you know, a big speed out. I, 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 hmm, I feel like I've, I, I, I've heard of it before, but I don't 100% know the answer. There's people here who probably know the answer better than I do, but um, I, I, don't, I don't think it's super GPU intensive. Um, do you, do you know what the computational bottleneck is? Is it the is it the FFTs or is it something else that really? Um, I think it's the 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 gridding itself, maybe, or the I'm not 100 percent sure. I haven't dug down into that particular aspect of it super much. Yeah, yeah there's there's nothing really that limits us from using GPUs except getting the data in and out, and it's a huge amount of data. Okay, right. So you're limited by the GPU plan that's available and that sort of thing. Yeah. Could you maybe run on multiple GPUs as a way of mitigating that problem? Yeah, so run on 24 GPUs with, how many gigs of RAM do the K40s have? Yeah, that might be a way of getting a lot more RAM. Well, you still have to load it in and out though if you're doing that across, across CPUs. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you had a eight GPU node, there are ways of having the GPUs talk directly to each other, but we only have two GPU nodes on Zen, yeah. so the wind might not be that great. But yeah, maybe something. Yeah, there's there's actually a different path that that is being explored to speed things up, and that's actually using FPGAs in computing. Sure. Okay. So that that's because the GPUs are too limited. In in we're talking about terabytes of data going in and out, and and the GPUs just can't handle that. Yeah. It's a very unique application. It's not very. It's it's very. It's easy to parallelize, but but the the sheer amount of data is is an unusual application. That's why we are we need a lot of memory as well. Right. Okay. Great. Um, and then my naive astronomy questions. Seth, can you go back to the cannonball? Yeah. Slide. I just want to make sure I understand what you're describing there. So you're saying this was originally a binary system, and then the 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 neutron star got ejected when the so, other star supernova, or it was that star that supernova. So that it, it was the core of the star that supernova. Basically, when you have a supernova, it's thought that um, some fraction of them will tend to be mildly asymmetric as they collapse, and any sort of asymmetries get sort of um, massively exacerbated when this thing collapses down. And so, you know, any slight asymmetry will end up being like a massive kinetic velocity imparted onto this like core that's just you know smashed down and formed. Um, and so typically what we're talking about, it, like it's uh, called a, nat a natal kick, 
Um, and basically as these things are born, the supernova happens and these things just, you know, the, the supernova, but then also these things are kicking out at, you know, typically like hundreds of kilometers per second would be like kind of more normal maybe. Um, and this thing based on the current understanding of its distance and whatnot, it some, seems like it's maybe like a thousand kilometers per second, which I think makes it the second fastest ever observed or something like that. Like it's in the, the leagues of the fastest basically, but it's, it's really um, hoofing it through space basically. So that nebula, if that's the right term, is the original position, or perhaps close to it, or is it drifting? Yeah, that's that's the that's yeah, that's the expanding sort of debris from the explosion. Or and, then, and then the trail behind the source has actually been dragged along as it exited its system. Yeah, this is basically the um, well. So the kind of gist of it is like you've got this pulsar, which is giving off all this like exciting emission and stuff like that, and as it sort of rams through the interstellar medium, it excites a lot of sort of the gas along the way. And so what you're sort of seeing is like the, the tunnel drilled through the interstellar medium as this thing shoots out through space. Okay, and, and my, my impression is that you were talking about, um, you know, only being able to see the gamma ray emissions, but not, um, I guess, lower wavelengths because of interstellar media. I mean, can you use that? There's probably better ways, but is there, can you use that a way of mapping interstellar media density? Um, so I think to some extent it's sort of been done because like there are like diffuse models that Fermi puts in and they have to kind of have some understanding of the emission of like the, the emission in the galaxy. Um, but I think the problem is you're dealing with like a sort of finite number of sources in the, the gamma rays. There have been similar like, um, it's actually, you know, using radio emission and how it gets like caught up in the interstellar medium is a fairly standard way to map out like densities in the galaxy um, to a certain extent. There's like lots of models that are based on how does emission from certain things get kind of caught up in the interstellar medium. It's probably harder to do with gamma rays because you just got like less stuff, um, but it's done at radio all the time. Yeah. So there are more common sources you can do that with than these, these neutral stars. Got it. Yeah. Pulsars are fairly typically uh, used for that sort of thing, just because the pulse emission, you can kind of watch it spread out a little bit more is my understanding. Great. Um, does anyone else have questions? Well, thank you very much. That was a really clear um, presentation that, that uh, really highlighted how Xena is able to help you with this, calculate these things. I'm actually curious. So the NRAO, I assume, has its own, I know it has its own supercomputing center. Um, what is the advantage, if any, I mean, presumably there's an advantage running it at Xena just because it's local to UNM, or what, is there some reason why you went at Xena rather than NRA? So um, the big mem nodes were one of the biggest draws. So the sort of largest memory that you can get on the uh, NRAO stuff is, I think, what was it, 512 gigabytes? Okay. Um, and so that's for uh, some number of nodes on uh, Luster or done in NM post, so it's done in Socorro. Um, and so it's sort of a balance of like, which is, which is better, you know, one node with tons of Ram or like a couple of nodes with like, you know, one sixth of the Ram sort of. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it seems like, at least for our purposes, we wanted to try just sort of leveraging less nodes with a, a ton more Ram. Um, and that seems to be working fairly well for our purposes. Great. That's good to hear. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is Ethan. Ethan's going to talk about, uh, bioinformatics work he's been doing here at Carsey. Everyone is, wel is welcome to stay and listen to Ethan's talk as well. Um, let's see. And you have some people joining us, Ethan. Maybe they're already here. Yep, the bio folks are uh, in the Zoom. Very good. And um, are you okay with me recording your talk or are there pre-publication results you'd rather me not record? Yeah, you can record, yeah. Great, okay. So yeah, recording is still going. So feel free to take it away whenever you're ready. All right. So uh, today I'm gonna talk to you guys about uh, some assorted population genomics associated stuff that I've been working on at CARSI, uh, including a little bit of uh, uh, kind of more developmental uh, quick bite stuff, resources I've developed for CARSI users in addition to uh, my own data. Let's see. So uh, high performance computing centers are more or less essential for a lot of population uh, genetic and genomic work. Uh, basic, the, at a very basic level, 
uh, we need to uh, pretty much get the DNA sequences that we're going to be analyzing. And to do that, we need these variant calling pipelines, which are often very resource intensive. Uh, we also have stuff like uh, de novo assembly programs, which require a lot of memory, like on Xena. But most of the stuff I'm going to talk to you about today uh, is more fit for Wheeler uh, with uh, pretty much the ability to parallelize uh, either replicates or regions of the genome. Uh, certain analyses uh, kind of with the output of this initial pipeline uh, will also require uh, a lot of uh, resources like for replicates and demographic models and replicates and population genetic simulations, uh, which I'm going to explain to you uh, why they're uh, increasingly important. Some common questions that we ask with this kind of data uh, are stuff like what genes underlie a given trait. This trait can be anything from a plumage patch in a bird to a uh, gene associated with uh, genetic disease or any disease really. Uh, another thing that's used for uh, this approach called uh, metabarcoding or barcoding is taking a look at a sample and seeing what species are in that sample. We can also ask questions about uh, the evolutionary history of a clade, mostly in terms of phylogenetics, but also in terms of how speciation occurs in a given pair or a given clade. Uh, most, we, mostly with respect to gene flow, uh, which we're going to talk about in the second section, which pretty much means individuals moving from one population to another and breeding, pretty much uh, exchanging genes. An outline of this talk. So first, I'm going to talk about uh, a major pipeline or, or a parallelized pipeline for a very commonly used tool. Next, I'm going to talk about a uh, different pipeline for analyzing RADseq data in addition to an ongoing project working on these uh, pretty monarchs here. And finally, I'm going to go over two major population genetic simulation programs. So the pipeline I'm going to be talking about is GATK, the Genome Analysis Toolkit. Uh, it's kind of a major software or the, made, the software for uh, getting variants from uh, whole, skip, whole genome data. Uh, there's a set of best practices, which is outlined here. Uh, However, they're a bit opaque. They give you pretty much the names of the programs that you need to run, but they don't tell you how to run them in the most efficient way because they have a more efficient way programmed on uh, computing resources that they want you to pay to use. Uh, so what we really want to do is figure out a way to implement this uh, for users at CARSI and also users at other high performance computing centers. Uh, normally you see only little whispers of uh, kind of this parallelization method uh, that we're going to be talking about uh elsewhere where people are asking for help developing their own but don't really have a single resource to go to so the basics of how this pipeline works so we have these thin lines which represents our reads they're pretty much small strands of dna uh, that our dna sequencers read uh, we have not just dozens of them like here but we have uh, millions or billions of them uh, depending on the scale of the project these thick bars are the reference that we're aligning to. This reference pretty much represents every uh, bit of DNA in an organism's genome. Ideally, uh, they're, they represent chromosomes, but for non-model organisms, they oftentimes represent just uh, little chunks that we know approximately where they are, but we don't exactly know uh, what, they, what chromosome they represent. Uh, the first thing we do, we take all these reads uh, and we align them to our sample. You'll notice that some reads uh, that don't match were not aligned to the sample, uh, which is a good thing. And we use BWA for this, which is pretty much uh, implements an algorithm that compares these reads uh, to your context and maps them there. Uh, and the part where JTK comes in, uh, first we take this uh, kind of all these aligned reads and we say, okay, in comparison to our reference genome, which could be like a certain uh, bird that you happen to choose from a given area or a related species or whatever human your reference is made from. And you look at the reads and say, OK, where do these differ from our reference? And uh, you call those variants uh, with JTK's haplotype caller. And these variants can be anything from a single uh, nucleotide change, so like a A turning to a C, or it can be something more complex, like an entire uh, little certain sequence being inserted into the genome at that point. Next, uh, we combine all of our different samples, because normally this is done uh, for multiple samples because we want to ask a com question comparing them, and we genotype them, uh, also using GAT, all using GATK still. Um, and what we get is what these gold stars represent, which is major changes uh, from the reference genome 
that we are confident in, right? You can see this kind of reddish star, there's only one variant with one strand of DNA associated with it. So we're not really confident in that. Uh, and kind of the lighter orange star is one where it exists in another uh, sample, but there's only one read supporting it in that sample. And there are various ways of filtering it uh, that you can implement in GATK and other methods. And you, that's pretty much our final result. Uh, per sample, per uh, uh, interval, all these stretches of DNA that we're lining to, uh, we get all the variants that we're confident. In. Uh, sorry. However, the big issue here, uh, most B BWA can be parallelized uh, internally uh, within a node, and then you can then spread it across nodes as needed. Uh, but there's not really a way to parallelize within a sample for any of the GATK steps uh, built natively into the program. So we have to come up with our own ways. And the way that we do this uh, is a scatter gather approach. Pretty much, we take our reference and we break it into intervals and perform the steps, uh, the variant calling step and the combining and genotyping step on individual cores. So pretty much, uh, we have we are able to utilize as many cores as we have chunks of our genome, and we get the exact same result at the end, right? Uh, so pretty much, uh, it's easy to implement just using new parallel. Um, if you're familiar with CARSI, you'll probably be thinking that this is a good fit for Wheeler, which is correct, uh, because we don't need a lot of memory uh, for any of this pretty modest memory requirements overall, but uh, it makes great use of a lot of cores across different nodes, uh, which is really great for scaling outward. Um, and I've made a quick bite for this, which kind of walks through uh, the whole pipeline step-by-step uh, step and then provides uh, the full, implement, pretty much a full implemented PBS script ready for Wheeler on how to run it. And uh, what this is there for is helping users get starting on this kind of very start on this variant calling in parallel pipeline. One user has already made great use of it, something that was uh, taking far beyond uh, reasonable wall times on Wheeler, all of a sudden takes a matter of hours, uh, which is great to see. Um, and I don't have, I, I haven't put any of my own data through here yet, uh, but hopefully this summer I'll be getting data in hand that I can immediately run and get a report out in time <laughs> for a deadline. Under the next section, we're going to be talking about a different sequencing method uh, called RADSEQ, which stands for Restriction Site Associated DNA Sequencing. This is uh, one of what's called reduced representation sequencing, which you can think of. We're not getting the whole genome like in the last one. We're only getting chunks of the genome. And the way we get these chunks is uh, we use a restriction enzyme to recognize these sequences of DNA and then the restriction enzyme kind of binds there and it makes a cut uh, where you get these two tails of DNA. And then we can pretty much find those tails uh, using biochemical uh, methods and attach uh, sequencing things to them, meaning that we sequence stuff that is adjacent to the tails and nothing else in the genome. So you get a lot of reads stacked up for a small percentage of the genome, oftentimes around 1%. And it's a very good low cost option, which is great for certain questions. Uh, of which we'll give you some examples of later. Now, quick overview of the pipeline. Uh, this is uh, all easily run on Wheeler. It's not very resource intensive, uh, but it's generally above what you would want to do on your laptop, particularly for the first step, um, where uh, we take all of our reads and note that uh, a lot of them have these white dots, which represent the reads that we want. Uh, pretty much these are the cut sites uh, and the other reads we don't want. We take them. We align them to our reference first. So we pretty much get these stacks of uh, reads scattered across the genome. Uh, we do that with BWA again. And then we combine all of our samples together and call variants using the stacks G stacks uh, module. Um, and then we select the, our variants of interest and use the populations module uh, to pretty much generate input files so we don't have to write our own scripts or processing uh, VCFs, which is nice. Oh, and all this uh, also has a quick bite written for it. It's relatively straightforward, uh, but it's always good to demystify things uh, for users so you know that so they know that it's pretty easy to analyze this data that they have in hand. Now, as for my data with this, uh, we're focusing on these uh, handsome black and white monarchs in the Solomon Islands. Uh, the Solomons are located to the east of New Guinea, northeast of Australia, in the Pacific Ocean. 
And this is uh, kind of a representative map of them. Uh, the green islands are the ones we sampled. The gray ones and the green ones are both what the islands currently look like. But a really important thing to keep in mind for islands is during ice ages, uh, sea level is lower and islands that aren't normally connected uh, can be completely connected, right? Like the distance between Choisel and Isabel is pretty vast, but they were uh, completely connected at glacial maxima. Uh, and I want you to kind of recognize that there are four major groups here. Uh, the New Georgia group, uh, what we're going to call the Bukita group, which goes from Bougainville, uh, that through Choiso and Isabel and Gala to Guadalcanal, so that kind of chain of islands, uh, all has very similar closely related uh, populations. Then Malaita and Makira are isolated islands. So the question that we're going to ask here is how these birds have diversified and speciated on these islands. Um, speciation is pretty much the divergence of one population into two, um, ideally, uh, well, I guess more, more divergence is uh, one population turning into two. Speciation and differentiation are how they turn into full species and uh, get different phenotypes respectively. The classic model, you just have two isolated populations, such as two different islands, no gene flow between them. Um, and the reason gene flow is important is that uh, it tends to inhibit divergence. However, despite that, when you have something like uh, very different environments, you can get uh, the gene flow, that movement between population opposed by selection where you get divergence occurring across uh, this boundary. However, this boundary doesn't exist in island systems, but because a lot of these islands were never connected, we know that these birds had to move between them to colonize them, and it's reasonable to expect that that movement would continue to some degree over time, meaning that you get divergence with gene flow in allopatry, um, which sounds a bit uh, paradoxical, but it's worth noting that the gene flow here is generally going to be less than the middle example where they're in geographic contact. An important thing to know about gene flow is they can have huge impacts on phylogenetic inference. Uh, so the top one uh, there, you have more gene flow both in top and bottom from left and right. Uh, on the top one, you can see that two uh, taxa that are each other's closest relatives look like they diverged much more recently than they actually did because of gene flow. And when you have uh, taxa that aren't each other's closest relatives, it can completely alter the phylogeny. Um, and I've done some work in the past uh, kind of trying to relate island parameters to gene flow between islands uh, using classic MacArthur and Wilson island biogeography. And it takes into uh, account stuff like source island area, distance between islands, and sink diameter. And I use this uh, relatively simple equation uh, to relate them to pretty much get this NM, this number of migrants that you'll see in a couple places. Uh, but what you, you really need to know is that you get predictable changes uh, in this number of migrants based on these parameters. So compared to this normal null model here, increasing the source islands area increases the number of migrants between islands, as does decreasing the distance. And one that's not necessarily uh, possibly intuitive at first glance, uh, but is very important here is an increase in target size and increases gene flow. And we can use this to then generate some predictions about phylogenetic patterns that we see uh, in a given archipelago based on a given colonization history and levels of gene flow. Uh, so this is kind of a representation here. You've got uh, the central green one uh, of the Bukita group. Then you've got New Georgia and Malaita, that's blue and purple respectively, and then orange and Makira. Now for a model of gradual, so we're all assuming that colonization occurred from New Guinea and that Makira was colonized last, which is a pretty reasonable hypothesis uh, for most tax on the Solomons because most birds in the Solomons came from New Guinea or the Bismarck archipelago next to New Guinea. Uh, and Makira is the most isolated by a reasonable degree. Uh, so yeah, pretty much with gradual colonization, we get a phylogenetic pattern like this where Makira is uh, nestled within and we can tell uh, the order pretty cleanly. We can differentiate these nodes um, Next, for a model of rapid colonization, all the same pattern, but it's quick, it occurs so quickly that we can't really parse exactly what went on. And then there's rapid colonization with gene flow. And these arrows you'll see here represent the ease of gene flow between these islands. So the thicker ones going from Bukita, between Bukita and New Georgia and Bukita and Malaita are because those two have a much uh, greater target size and are a bit closer to Bukita compared to the orange uh, Makira, which really can only easily exchange sheets with Malaita and potentially some with Bukita. Um, and then you'll get a topology like this, where despite uh, it not being a reasonable thing with colonization history, you get Makira sister to everything else 
every other uh, group or island in the archipelago. And the other ones either being indeterminate uh, or potentially for reasons we'll discuss later, um, a light to being pulled to the outside of the Georgia and Kita. Uh, and this is uh, the main result I'm gonna focus on here. Uh, so remember this is our uh, color scheme again. And we do indeed find this. Uh, we get Bukita is sister to New Georgia. Uh, and that is sister to Malaita. It's worth noting uh, oh, this 82 here represents uh, the fact that we are not fully confident in our uh, phylogeny here, which uh, could very well be due to uh, the fact that it's not, right, it's not the real phylogeny. Um, and then most notably, we have strongly supported uh, that Makira is sister to everything else. Um, and the reason for this could be uh, Based on our kind of gene flow model, we have more gene flow between Melita and Makira than anything else in Makira, meaning essentially Melita is, you can view it as pulled to the outside by Makira and the gene flow there. However, just because we find this result, uh, we can't just assume there's gene flow. Uh, we have explicit statistical tests called ABA-BABA tests that we can use on our archipelago uh, to confirm that gene flow really did occur. I'm adding these all at once. Pretty much these arrows uh, represent uh, inferred gene flow and they're thick, uh, namely statistically significant gene flow. Uh, for example, we have not statistically significant gene flow between Well Canal and Akira. Um, and even if it was uh, significant, the raw value that it output was much lower than any of the others. Regardless, uh, just know that arrow thickness corresponds to amount of gene flow between these islands. So we have a lot of gene flow with these green arrows uh, within bu the Bukita group some gene flow between New Georgia and Malaita and the Bukita group, uh, as expected, pretty similar levels. And then uh, some degree of gene flow comparable to say Malaita and Bukita between Bakira and Malaita. Um, uh, and as I mentioned, we didn't detect anything significant between Bukita and, sorry, Bukita and the, and Bakira. Yeah. Um, another cool example about this system uh, that we found with this data set. Uh, so we did a, in 2017, the MSB went to uh, Renanga and collected many specimens. Uh, that's in the New Georgia group, specifically this little island here. And when we zoomed in on a subset of samples, uh, we found that this middle one here both is uh, phenotypically kind of intermediate between Renanga and Columbangra. It looks a good deal like more like the Columbangra ones. Uh, but what our genetic data confirmed was that it was an F1 hybrid uh, between a bird from Renanga and a bird from Colombangra, presumably Colombangra or possibly a different island in uh, the main kind of New Georgia Pleistocene complex, the stuff that was connected at Glacial Maxima, uh, which is really cool. This is not something that's been documented much and the distance between Renanga and Colombangra is not that much different from the distance between say New Georgia and Bukita, only a few kilometers difference there. Uh, so yeah. Um, Anyways, uh, so we'll go into a bit more of the stuff within the Bukita group uh, later in this section uh, where we're talking about population genetic simulations. Uh, and the reason that we need to need them is essentially there are a lot of situations that are either too challenging or too costly to explore, explore experimentally. Uh, and we want to validate empirical results that we get uh, to confirm that they actually match with the processes at hand. As for example, uh, one could do that for the phylogenetic hypotheses that we tested uh, in the last section. And we can use simulations, uh, populations to answer these. Um, and there are two major kinds. So forward simulations are essentially where you track individuals um, and their genes uh, going forward in time. So pretty much uh, from a starting population to an ending one. Backward simulations are a bit more difficult to wrap your head around, a bit less straightforward. Um, but essentially you're taking a population of individuals and looking backward in time to see across the genome to see where a given section of genome uh, diverged uh, between those two individuals, uh, oftentimes across different populations. Um, bit tricky to explain, but pretty much uh, I'll outline the basic differences between them and show you an example. Uh, so MS prime is what we're going to be talking about for backward simulations. Uh, it's very simple, it's very fast, and it's implemented in Python. It utilizes tree sequences from this TS kit thing uh, to simplify the population histories. And it's very fast and it's not very memory intensive uh, compared to those forward options, uh, which is the big difference between backwards and forwards. However, you can't do a lot of complicated stuff with it. 
right? You're really just diver dealing with diverging populations and simulating sequences fairly neutrally. Um, and as such, uh, because it's not very memory intensive, uh, I developed a quick byte that pretty much outlines how to run it on Wheeler uh, for this 1.0 release. Uh, and it's funny because this 1.0 release happened pretty much the day I finished a quick bite, writing a quick bite for the 0.7 release without much warning. Uh, so that, that meant I had to do a pretty quick revision on that, but now it's up and running. And I used, uh, sorry, some simulations in MS Prime to get at a question of within the Lakita group, you might've noticed uh, you have the island of Guadalcanal that wasn't fully connected to the rest of the Bukita group. And that appears to show in our genetic data. So FST is pretty much a metric for how different uh, two populations are. You'll see Choisel and Isabel have an FST of uh, 0.3, which is pretty low. Uh, and then Isabel and Balcanal have a higher FST, meaning they are more different. And what we do, we take uh, the times these islands have been separated and uh, other factors like their size and theoretical population densities to run these backward simulations. And we get to a point where we get our uh, an estimate of SST comparable to what we see with our empirical data between choice and Isabel. And pretty much uh, by default, because FST uh, decreases uh, or takes longer to increase with larger population sizes, uh, we have lower FST between Isabel and Guadalcanal in our simulations. However, an alternate hypothesis is that Guadalcanal just has lower population density than the other islands. So we go through and we iteratively lowered uh, the population density on our simulated Guadalcanal. And we found that we would need 16% of the population density uh, that's found on Isabel or Choisel to match uh, our empirical findings, which isn't really consistent with what we see on the ground, uh, which leads us to conclude that this water gap, albeit very small, and the birds very similar on either side of it, uh, it's still enough to produce some degree of population structure. Uh, which in our paper about this, we kind of used to scale up, say, okay, in this fairly small scale, easy to palette situation, we have our divergences controlled only via gene flow effectively. Um, however, in our, uh, what, sorry, which then scales up to our big phylogenetic framework uh, where they also are controlled via, via gene flow, but in a kind of a more dramatic way, right? Um, anyways, uh, for our forward simulations, we use SLIM3. Uh, which has a very steep learning curve and longer run times, but can still is still, to my knowledge, normally relatively low memory intensity. Um, and it's very good for more complex processes like natural selection acting on genes in the genome. Um, and that complexity is kind of outlined in a 660 page manual. They have a table of contents of which is, I show here. Um, and another cool thing about SLIM is that it gives you an IDE with a GUI for debugging and making allows you to make sure that uh, you're doing exactly what you want to do, the populations are doing what they should be, uh, before you then send it off to a high performance computing center to perform however many replicates and explore whatever parameter space you need to, uh, which can of course uh, be done uh, quite easily using new parallel, uh, which uh, I haven't made the quick bite for this yet, but I'm planning on aiming it at Wheeler pretty much uh, for similar reasons to all the other ones, right? relatively low memory requirements, uh, but able to scale very well across multiple different nodes. Um, now, uh, an example for this uh, is using this framework uh, that I developed in the past and talked about earlier, where we use island parameters to plug it into this equation to get number of birds moving between islands each generation. And we can use uh, either a theoretical or an empirical uh, island setup to effectively estimate number of migrants between those islands and then plug that into our SLIM sim simulation and ask questions like, how does the distance between islands affect the probability of speciation given different selection pressures? How does it affect the persistence of, uh, and pretty much resistance against inbreeding in small island populations at different distances? Uh, there's a lot of stuff like that. And it could be like our own questions like that or just straight up plugging it into previously established uh, SLIM simulations uh, to get it uh, questions uh, that other people have asked, but in a different island setting with different assumptions. Anyways, a quick summary of all this. Uh, we have our variant calling pipeline implemented uh, in a quick bite uh, for Wheeler. Similarly, this RADSeq analysis where we uh, 
uh, kind of showed that gene flow uh, can, that to some degree controls the phylogenetic patterns we see in the Solomon Islands. Um, and finally, we have our two modes of simulations, uh, which are increasingly important for population genetics. So yeah, uh, that's it. Any questions? Thanks very much. That was great. Questions from anybody? Um, I have a question. I was mm -hmm. wondering if you could go over the that equation a little bit more. <laughs> that was really tantalizing. Uh, yeah. Gladly. Yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> I, 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 did, I figured uh, since uh, I wanted to focus on computing, I wouldn't uh, hit it too hard. Well, I guess I had it at the end, didn't I? Whatever. Um, what, so you pretty much, um, well, where is it? All right. Whatever, I should have just gone back to the end. Um, so you have this number of migrants, uh, which pretty much corresponds to the number of birds moving between islands. You have this term here, this alpha, which corresponds to the propensity of a given area to produce propagules uh, in this area, uh, so source island area. And then uh, this, I kind of combined it into two things here. It's effectively two terms. You have T1 over two pi uh, di, which is uh, effectively the percent chance that a bird randomly dispersing from an island is going to hit um, your uh, sink, your target essentially. And then you have this exponential uh, decay equation, uh, which is invoked um, and is pretty much the favored one in MacArthur and Wilson's uh, uh, by geography uh, implementation, uh, where uh, pretty much birds fall off at an exponential rate uh, over distance corresponding to this uh, lambda parameter here, which is the inverse of dispersal distance. Um, yeah, or inverse of mean dispersal distance. Um, in, so you're, hmm? you're saying the numerator is basically how far they can fly before they drop into the ocean. Uh, yep, pretty much. Well, it's more like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, 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 it corresponds to that. Um, just like the probability given a distance of something that something can actually reach the island. Right. Yeah. And the I, the eyes are like one island with respect to another. Yeah, yeah. So this could be used for other different combinations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so like, uh, all right, all the way to the end. <laughs> I should have just stayed there. Um, uh, oh yeah, here. Uh, so for example, um, really this is like N1, N1 corresponds to this first distance uh, or second distance, pretty much like saying for a given distance, for a given area, yeah. But, okay, so you have that I term, but Shouldn't these be pairs? I guess does the does the diameter of the source island matter for whether you hit the diameter of the of the sink? Um, not in so so this is a, a somewhat uh, simplified version of it. Um, not in this kind of uh, we kind of assume that that wouldn't be the case for this. However, in reality, uh, it would to some degree. Um, a more complicated thing that I'm looking into implementing is pretty much saying for a given point. Uh, what probability that point has of hitting that. So I can say like, like this would have a much better chance of reaching our target island than something on the opposite side of the island per se. And we can even then say like, okay, these birds aren't gonna cross the entire island to fly across a different ocean probably and say, we probably won't get birds from the small, fall, far half of the island. Uh, so there are ways to improve, but yeah. Um, it, so this just estimates one given edge. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be paired, uh, sure. but you can take a ratio of those to pretty much say, okay, does our empirical estimates of number of migrants through demographic modeling or something match our uh, neutral expectations or is there a deviation maybe due to say wind direction uh, is something that I found in the paper that this is from uh, might be influencing uh, or decreasing dispersal ability effectively between islands. Um, Seth, I think I saw your hand up earlier. Oh, you were applauding. Oh, yeah, it's just I was applauding. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, so, obviously, I guess the Solomon Islands are a great example of how you can, they're a perfect setup for this. Mm -hmm. is, it, is it generalizable to other systems? I mean, can you look at, you know, um, glaciation or, or islands in North America that are, Glacial islands and that sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, for any, so so I guess 
yeah, for, for any of this, it's all applicable, applicable to any islands. Um, I will say for uh, this particular setup in the Solomons, uh, it does kind of have this assumption that you have one given uh, clade radiating on those islands. Um, but for the simulation framework, uh, that could definitely apply to any set of islands. Yeah, it, well, it's I all- think, Right, I think even population islands that are not literally islands, right? But oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that, that uh, pretty much would, yeah. You, that, that might be a case where you want to uh, move away from say an exponential decay of uh, distance over time, uh, but yeah. Just because, you, and that's one of the complications with all this, it's like, what if there's an ability for them to land on a small islet in between uh, and hang out yeah. in a palm tree for two minutes and then continue dispersing pretty much, resetting their dispersal kernel. Yeah. Sure. Um, which is a complication, but yeah. Uh, it, it, is, it is also the kind of thing that in theory should, to some degree, average out, I think, but I can better test that with these simulations to say, okay, how much... Yeah, would we actually expect that? Okay, other questions? All right, well, thanks again, um, Seth and Ethan. This, is, this has been really great, and I, and I appreciate you pitching them at a level where I can understand most of what you're, what you're talking about. So thanks, Beth. Um, I think we'll end there unless there's anything else. Okay. Uh, so Seth, do you mind ending the um, session so I can grab the sure. video? Thank you. Uh, end meeting for all. All right. Bye.